Well, welcome back, and we're going to start now with uh, conversation with Rasha Salti, who, as many of you know, plays a number of roles. I, it strikes me that in the kinds of societies we come from, there is a great and enriching hybridity of practice. So Rasha is a writer, a curator, and a programmer for film, and also an astute observer, observer of the um, social and political um, schisms, if you will, that have informed particularly uh, North Africa and West Asia in recent years. So I think it's around those questions that we're going to be developing this conversation. So welcome, Russia. It's Thank you very pleasure much. to be in conversation with you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Bach. Thank you, um, House of World Hakave. I've learned to say it. I used to say Eshkave. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for coming. It's Friday night. You should be drinking and enjoying life, not listening to us. Um, I wanted to... Um, I was absolutely delighted and uh, thrilled with uh, Ranjit's uh, um, lecture. And uh, it was provocative in uh, very positive ways. And I wanted to... Um, it resurrected or it uh, brought to life uh, two um, images in my head. Uh, the first one is a very simple one. When you were defining uh, cosmopolitanism, which is a word I have, you, you made me, uh, you um, invited me to make peace with it because I detested it so much. Uh, cosmopolitanism is often taxed uh, on uh, people who speak uh, many languages and travel planes when they come from the south <laughs> than when they come from the north. Um, so I've uh, rejected that label, but you're absolutely right. I, would, uh, I used to say worldly, be <laughs> because it uh, comes from a further place in time. But when you were defining cosmopolitanism, you mentioned uh, one of the verbs you used, which I adore, is listening. And um, be because English is not my native language, uh, the dictionary is, uh, is one of my closest uh, accomplices. And uh, when you um, peruse the dictionary, you begin to have a real relationship with words, their origins, etc. And, and I discovered that um, listen comes from list. And to list, initially, is to desire. So listening is actually opening oneself to the desire of the other. So it really ha has nothing to do with hearing, but it has to do with desire. And within your notion of cosmopolitanism, I think it, um, lis listen and listening um, are particularly potent and take on, uh, or suggest desire, which is nice. The second, um, the second image that came to my uh, mind, um, uh, because of the Arab Spring, and I will call it Spring, uh, I, a year ago I would reject that notion, but now I really hang on to it, because uh, everybody, or a lot of people, seem to think that uh, it's uh, winter. <laughs> um, so I'm not uh, one of the uh, Arab revolutionaries. I live in Beirut, where no hope of uh, any insurgency, uh, I think, uh, is possible, which is fine. Uh, we have other uh, exciting or uh, sites for possible renewal or transformation, but I did have the immense privilege of being, of visiting Cairo and being, uh, going to Tahrir Square on a very, ins uh, not insignificant, but one of the many mobilizations that happened after the fall of the Mubarak regime. So it was uh, July 8, uh, 2012. And it was um, one of those many mobilizations, but w what had happened at that time was that Tahrir was, had become a place, maybe not of assembly, but where there was some kind of a code being uh, formulated uh, informally, intangibly, um, but if you 
um, so this is thinking about mobilization versus assembly. If you can imagine Tahrir is a square where there's actually lawn or grass, and then um, all the uh, uh, access of the streets were closed on the lawn or on the grass, there were tents set up for protesters to sleep, talk, da da da. And then around it, there's a first ring of people who just stand up, look at what's going on, and there's another ring of people who move, and there's an outer ring of stages. Yeah, podiums, stages. So if you look from a distance, it looks like the perfect embodiment of a public sphere. Because one stage, there's a rock concert. Another stage, there's the leftist with their you know, country guitar, lovey-dovey type of songs. Another stage is the Muslim Brotherhood. A third stage, the socialist. A fourth stage, the Nasserist. Fifth stage, Salafist, and so on and so forth. And what was interesting, what was completely actually mesmerizing to me was that they were not canceling each other out. That I don't know by what miracle of physics and acoustics you could actually stand in front of one and hear it and then move and then... And somehow your image of the mobilization and versus assembly came up. Because there is something of a mobilization. And I think in the perhaps more positive sense of the term, in the sense that you were there by your own sheer will and agency. You, there was, you didn't receive a phone call or a tract from the party, a parachik, uh, intimidating you to go. There was no promise of a reward, a tangible reward. You were not uh, terrorized to go there, you chose to go there. And at the same time, there was no real program uh, drafted. Uh, but there was an understanding that these stages were activated by political speeches and music and other things. And then, um, so it is a mobilization, but it's also a place of maybe not an assembly in the sense of a parliament or a party meeting or an association meeting, but there is a, the, under these tents, serious political discussions between people who don't usually uh, talk to each other about these issues was taking place. So, uh, just yeah, that's these were my opening remarks. Yeah, but it also reminds me. Thank you for this truly evocative account of the possibilities that were present in uh, Medan Tahrir. But it also reminds me of another story that you told us about uh, what you heard there which is of a young man, an adolescent, more or less? Yeah, I mean, I guess late, uh, I mean, 18, 20 years old, yeah. Who? Yeah. Well, yeah. You tell the story. <laughs> so one of the, at some point, uh, so there are a few mosques around Tahrir, and at some point, um, I think there was a call to prayer, or the time had come for prayer. And um, out of respect for everybody, the, the secularists or the Gnostics or the heretics, I don't know. But this man was handling the stage where there was music going on. And uh, he, uh, the musicians stopped uh, playing music, knowing. And he went on stage and he, was, uh, um, he made a little speech. Uh, announcing that uh, there was a, um, they would stop for a while for the call to prayer and then uh, that the program would resume and, and he got carried away in his speech and when he was interpolating the crowd he called uh, on all Egyptians, the Egyptian people and then he said Muslims, Christians and Jews and he's 20 years old uh, he cannot possibly remember the time when the Jewish community in Egypt was present, thriving, and definitely part of Egyptian society. He also, I mean, there's nothing in the mainstream culture or even the alternative dissident culture that mourns the departure of the Jewish population of Egypt. It, it really fascinated me. It also made me incredibly happy that he felt that it should be said. I don't know where it came from. It's part of also this understanding uh, the way these new political subjectivities are being formed 
from within these insurgencies. It's true that uh, what the world has seen was a beautiful crowd of people, uh, um, you know, demanding bread, justice, and dignity, and in many ways, uh, and unseating a regime of terror, and then voting for the Muslim Brotherhood. So it looks like uh, uh, the voting for the Muslim Brotherhood has disappointed a lot of people. And it made it look like whatever process was going on is finished. I don't believe it's finished. And um, I think uh, we, it's, this, this, these political moments are a challenge for us to understand or revise the way we observe social change. We understand the time it takes. The chronology of social change and political change I, I don't know if we, are, um, we have the theoretical tools to measure it. When we people say it's too late or it's too early, what does it mean? I don't understand what it means. I know that what I'm seeing is utterly captivating. Most of the time, I don't know where it comes from. It's, yeah. Which is actually what I was thinking I would put to you at some stage, but I'm glad you've brought it up, this notion of chronology and uh, what kind of reserve might reserves of form, reserves of ideas, might inhabit a chronological understanding. Because I think when we talk about cosmopolitanism, just as a default position, there's often a sense that it is somehow horizontally expansive across cultures and societies. But I'm wondering whether we can also conceive of a notion of the cosmopolitan that is, in some sense, vertical, chronological, goes back and forth in time. And I often think that the Arab world actually is this amazing, uh, Arab world is a restrictive... Uh, That's fine. Yeah, I've, I'm I've, happy with those. <laughs> <laughs> to the alarm of some of my friends, I've sometimes used the term uh, the house of Islam. <laughs> we'll put aside the whatever historical connotations it has, but it has a certain sort of geographical and cultural meaning. Yeah. But there's, it's also an amazing crucible of notions of uh, projects of modernity. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, because what that young man said in Tahrir was absolutely amazing. There was no reason to have that memory. And yet there are reserves of memory in the Arab world. I'm thinking particularly of uh, a notion such as uh, Arab nationalism. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to comment a bit about these spectral presences that may or may not inhabit contemporary discourse in that part of the world. Um, uh, one of the... One of the questions I've been asking myself, uh, you know, I can't say that I'm experiencing these insurgencies or revolutions, but I'm certainly witnessing them, uh, is whether this is, uh, you know, we theorized colonial liberation. Do we have the final word on that? Uh, were we right? <laughs> Did we miss the point? I don't know. But certainly, it, I think a lot about Fanon, and I think a lot about Edward Said, and I think a lot about the ideologies that we were raised with uh, of national liberation. Um, I think a lot of, about them a lot in this moment. Um, it is definitely... It feels, especially with the um, insurgency in Syria, it really feels like colonial emancipation. Uh, I, yeah, to historicize, yes, the amount of labor protests and student protests that have taken place in the 70s, in the 80s, and in the 90s are tremendous. Problem is, they have not been recorded properly. I mean, unless you have a grant uh, to do labor history, they, they, they don't exist anywhere in the mainstream, uh, in, in, in history books. The impression is that the biggest victims of Nasser and um, Mubarak and Sadat were the Muslim brotherhoods. Sure, they were sent to prison, they were punished. But the left was as well. Uh, the unions were broken um, by, um, by, by the elimination, systematic elimination of bright uh, union leaders and workers, etc. 
Um, for instance, I mean, people, it's not common knowledge that in 2009 there were uh, more than 200 uh, protest actions, including strikes, sit ins, etc., by more than 30,000 workers in Egypt. So, do we write those? I mean, you know, so, so actually this Tahrir thing didn't come from nowhere. 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 Another, speaking about memory, uh, a lot of the um, people who, the young people that we saw on Al Jazeera and CNN, etc., their parents were part of the 1977 bread strikes uh, that took place in Egypt and that were very violently crushed. Um, Arab nationalism is a complicated project. And certainly nationalism has not been the most uh, potent uh, ideological vehicle for forging plural, tolerant, complicated subjectivities. Okay? Um, its precursor was something else. Its precursor was Arabism, which is a diffuse, a more diffuse, uh, less uh, dogmatic, uh, more a uh, sense of uh, being in the world, a cultural affiliation, an empathy, a compassion. Is my microphone painful? Arabism was born at a moment at the turn of the 20th century, uh, late 19th century, at a very important moment. The uh, Ottoman Empire was going through major reforms. Uh, there was an in the first encounter or a second encounter with the so-called West, and at a time of reconfiguring uh, place, uh, state governance, uh, political agency, etc. It led to, it prob I mean, it is considered the foundation for Arab nationalism, uh, but it did not dictate, uh, you know, like Pan-Africanism, it did not dictate a unity uh, rooted in, um, in ideology. Um, the other thing I wanted to, um, of late, I have been assigned to um, work in um, the African continent. And one of the, ah, I wanted to mention this, that uh, today Chinua Achibe died. Yes. And uh, I thought things fall apart should be, <laughs> so just a thought for Chinua Achibe. Um, uh, you know that the borders in, uh, in the African continent were actually drawn in uh, blood and fire and by purely the outcome of the colonial imaginary in a much more exaggerated and uh, terrifying way than in the Arab world. Um, what, I, what is interesting is after all this time, after 50 or 60 years, um, uh, formations, sub-regional formations like the West African Union has enabled completely informally uh, the most wonderful exchanges between countries that had drawn these arrogant chauvinistic borders between Senegal, Nigeria, Ghana. You have a movement, uh, you have a generation that is rediscovering uh, affinities and they are, uh, they are reviving um, their grandparents uh, ethnic, cultural, linguistic, uh, uh, shared heritage and conversations in a completely different way. Uh, but, but at least this is a realm where you can move without a visa. And uh, for, when you think about the insurgency that took place in Lagos in uh, January of, uh, this year, of last year, and the insurgency that took place in Senegal uh, later, just a few months later, there was so much shared stories, so much complicity, uh, and with Cairo, and with Tunisia. Uh, somehow, this inherited world, South continent, Southern continent, is experiencing, uh, 
is playing around with these categories, almost, uh, I mean, in French we would say détournement, almost like turning them upside down or co-opting them in the most creative and um, uh, potentially productive ways. But that also means seeking recourse to archives that have dropped out of sight. So how are those to be reconstituted? Um, With, without falling into, without lapsing into a certain kind of nostalgia. Because I think for me that's always a concern to look back to before the colonial encounter and to seek other kinds of uh, trails and traces of uh, connections that were then broken during colonial uh, rule. But how, how can one do that without being nostalgic? Is, is, uh, that seems to me to be a hazard. Yeah, it is a hazard and I'm, I don't know enough to tell you, to assure you <laughs> that there is no... I, I, let's say that on my end I did not sense that there was uh, nostalgia per se, uh, or an essentializing of um, of uh, pre or of of, of uh, sub uh, regional uh, like ethnic or tribal identities. Um, for instance, I mean, I will just give you a small example. Uh, so Nigerian hackers helped the Senegalese insurgents. Uh, Fela Kuti was being sung in uh, or was an icon of the Senegalese rappers who were taking over uh, the forbidden public space. I mean, it's, it's things like that. Yeah. So that's much more the production of a new, if you will, third yeah. culture. It's not yeah. looking back so no, much as... No, it's not a looking back, no. Yeah. But uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, because... Um, the fact that if you, I mean, you know, if you're um, the, the languages, right? Like where Wolof is spoken and where Pearl is spoken and where Yoruba is spoken, etc. And uh, the territorial borders don't fit the ethnic, I mean, thing, whatever. They don't fit the ethnic boundaries. And uh, when the borders between countries are open, if Yoruba is spoken here and Yoruba is spoken here, then you find encounters between Ghanaians and Nigerians uh, facilitated by the fact that their grandmother had taught them to speak, uh, you know, that's, yeah. A whole host of other questions, but I'm wondering if we want to bring in the larger participation of the audience and then we can loop back into questions. Would you like that, Rasha? Yes. Yeah. If there are questions at this I'm point. I'm a very obedient Arab woman. <laughs> I guess there's a microphone roll, right? There are no questions. Well, I'm happy to. I can continue with. Uh, yeah, I thought there was a question there. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's give me a shot. Mr. Oscote, I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name exactly. I've listened to your introductory talk and to the conversation you're having now. And it seems to me that the idea of an insurgent cosmopolitanism on a global scale is not contradictory to mobilization. Mobilization is a crucial component of coming to any concept of insurgent cosmopolitanism. And I think the reason is that in order to come to such a concept, you will be forced to confront the current global political order, those holding monopolies of power that have no interest in a definition of politics that somehow moves beyond territoriality, beyond concept of the nation state, and all the symbols that we believe are archaic and should somehow be abandoned. They will fight you, and they will fight this concept, and they are continuously doing it in all the protests that we've seen in the last decade, because it causes a threat. Only because it causes a threat, it is important. This means that you might not want to confront this through a wonderful discursive process.
practice. And I much appreciate your definition of what such a insurgent cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism might be. You wonderfully describe my own wish for a definition of politics that somehow moves beyond the concept of territoriality, a concept of the people that is differentiated rather than homogeneous. But exactly this differentiated people, to fight for that, you have to confront the fact that even if you would not want to use violence, even if you would not want to mobilize, you will have to. Because never will such a concept arise if you are not willing to. And all the protests, all the important social movements from the last 10 years, and their seeming end that is coming to now, is a result of not yet being capable of confronting exactly those violent dimensions that are at the basis of any meaningful social change. It's not because we want to use violence, it's because at a certain point you are confronted with the absolute necessity to defend those universal principles. It will not go without a fight, unfortunately. Great. <laughs> I could actually respond to that briefly, but I think we're <laughs> taking, sort of taking the... No, but I mean, but, I will also respond. Yeah, that'd be great. Just to say that among the many concerns with which I would meet your objection is a concern with the ethical costs of counter-violence. I don't at all deny that, of course, one is to defend what one believes, and that cannot only be done discursively. But I think we should also be attentive to the kinds of repercussions that evolve from our own pragmatic decisions. There's a whole pragmatics, of course, to how one resists. But what does that cost? What coalitions does it lead one into? What strategies does it commit one to? And effectively, what kind of subjectivity does one then become, I think, is a question that uh, needs to be tested and revisited. But I don't know if you want to come in on this, Rush. Yeah, I mean, this is what I meant when I said that uh, I started thinking about Fanon. Um, I mean, this, the Syrian insurgency did not become seriously armed or did not f fire weapons until, until at least a year and a half or a year. And it was really, and the, the Tunisian certainly did not fight back with violence even though they had suffered a lot of violence. I think that it's precisely, to me, it's that question, what kind, you pay the price. Once you engage in a language of violence, it becomes constitu constituent to the subjectivity that you are forming. And, 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 it, and, it, and you pay that price later. The, I, I'm not just Lebanese, I'm also Palestinian, and I'm Palestinian. My parents were the generation uh, that made the what was called the Palestinian Revolution, the you know, victory until death, uh, liberation through arms. Armed struggle had a promise at a certain time, and seemed to be the answer. I think this these insurgents of the that made the Arab Spring have uh, proposed something else. Um, I'm, I'm not a political theorist. I am just somebody who observes. But, but this question is really key. I live in a place where armed struggle and violence and civil war um, have been part, a really intimate part of my life. I'm convinced now that there are other ways. Violence is also failure of the imagination. Um, I know that um, one of the most uh, despairing things in Palestine is the apartheid wall. But I also think about the state of Israel and the military arsenal that they have, and it's so sophisticated and technologically it keeps outdoing itself. But when you build a wall to protect yourself from the enemy, you no longer see. It, it, 
when you it means you are, have run out of ideas maybe the arab insurgencies are about a new political imaginary a new political vocabulary um, a new way of imagining fighting back the corporations are really powerful but they're always but the insurgents are a step ahead always they're always catching up they're always reactive they don't they haven't invented a new word ne neoliberalism keeps reselling us a close past in a new in a flat packaged nice way but ne neoliberal capital has not sold us anything new they, it keeps selling us the past yes maybe if you allow me to make a last comment as a response to this i think that when you suggest that the use of violence comes as a, from a lack of imagination i would return to say that thinking that when i speak of a fight that this somehow is reduced to buying M16s and hiding in the mountains is maybe a lack of imagination of what violence can be and of what violent resistance can or has to be. One can only think of the digital insurgence that has also been taking place against mass data databases in that same last 10 years, which I think is a highly, highly important and structural understanding of what resistance can, can be. And I find that in both your uh, talks and in your conversation, but maybe I'm wrong, you tend to fall back to a discursive poetic language that fails to address the material conditions through which any revolt and therefore any true poetry can emerge. And with these material conditions, I mean exactly the shape in which that fight will have to somehow take place and the shape for which we imagine how that fight can or have, has to take place. Okay, I will stop now. Um, I will just, I will also give you a, uh, a tangible example of one way, one anecdote, and I'm, I'm an anecdote, I keep telling anecdotes, I'm not a theorist, I'm a storyteller. Um, in the town of Siliana, I was planning to talk about this tomorrow in my presentation. In the town, small town in Silia, uh, called Siliana in Tunisia, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood controlled government appointed a provincial governor that the town did not want under any circumstance. A provincial governor is the guy who decides where to pave the road, what to do with the school, how to collect garbage, etc. So it's not. It's a very pragmatic, practical post. They do not uh, subscribe to the Muslim Brotherhood. They felt this guy would not represent their interests, embody their aspirations, etc. So they protested. First day they protested peacefully, the police came. Second day they protested peacefully, the police came. Third day the army came. The fourth day, you know what they did? They moved out. They moved out of the town, all of them. You, there are pictures of hundreds of thousands of people just, they said, said to him, you want to rule? Rule. You're not going to rule us. This is one way in which I am just saying there are ways of fighting violence that are, not, that are more imaginative than, uh, shooting, than engaging in the logic of violence. Speaking of the tangible, also, I was thinking of uh, your experience in, as a curator now of the kinds of, um, one hesitates to even call them artworks, the kinds of testimony that is emerging from situations of urgency, whether in uh, Lebanon or whether in Palestine or in Syria. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the kinds of um, shall we say, ethical uh, situations in which you find yourself when you look at this testimony, if you will, often, as we know, um, 
images that come to us in the moment of the death of whoever was taking those images. And talk a little bit about how you feel in terms of a, a certain affinity with, a certain partisanship for, and the possibility of viewing objectively uh, this kind of testimony. And could it, could it even be drafted into the rubric of art, art making, art making as urgency? I mean, yes, th th this is a complicated situation and um, with whatever experience and knowledge I have at my disposal, I've tried to find the most fair or in my, ma in my mind, the most fair and reasonable um, form of engagement. So because I'm a film programmer and because I am in some circles, I am known to have um, um, become an expert in Syrian cinema. Uh, I was often asked when the insurgency in Syria started to uh, curate a program of uh, Syrian films from the insurgency. There, there was a lot of production uh, stuff that, you, that was posted on YouTube, but also other uh, kinds of, uh, of things, short films, etc. And somehow I felt that uh, these big festivals with, or small festivals even with money um, in the West <laughs> uh, just needed to have this sidebar and tick a, uh, a box in their list. We uh, pay tribute to the Syrian insurgency or we are acknowledging the Arab Spring so we will just show these films. I just, it was just too easy and I didn't feel right. And I, as a curator, I did not want to be the mediator uh, of, uh, or even the brand, these things. I don't even know if they are films, anyway. I know they are audiovisual materials of different sort. Some of them have a cinematic dimension. Some of them are uh, just audiovisual, uh, citizen journalism, uh, evidence, forensic evidence. <coughs> so, um, what I propose instead is um, a lecture with, um, with where I show things, images, still images and, and audiovisual images, but where I'm uh, able to provide a framework and a critical framework, not, uh, a, propa not a you know, stupidly propagandist uh, framework, where uh, the there are many questions that surface at the same time paying tribute to the insurgents that are ultimately you know that are at the front lines risking their lives etc one of the most interesting things or confusing things to me is the way in which and this is again the question of political imaginary um, the way uh, art, uh, the strategy and the language of uh, contemporary or modern or postmodern art have been used in the context of the insurgency uh, to fight back, to interpolate the imaginary. And of course, uh, because I, I am engaged with the Syrian art scene and the Syrian film scene, it, it, for instance, it was astounding to me to find uh, actions that were textbook situationist, even though, uh, first of all, situationists are no longer in style. B, they have not entered the pedagogical curriculum. And, and this is the question, right? Does, does a moment of tremendous political opening and possibilities what it does to the imaginary, um, what it uh, enables. Um, there are a hundred anecdotes and, and a lot of beautiful images, very, very compelling. The other question is, of course, and um, it was actually in the context of the previous edition of the former West where I did this, uh, where that was my contribution. Uh, what will happen to these... Um, how do, they're not objects, they are videos, they are images. What will happen after the insurgency is, is over? That's a big question too. Will they go into a museum? Will they be sold at Christie's? Or will they be in the next uh, documenta? <laughs> Which also leads one to the question of uh, what form an institution might take 
if it were to be anchored somewhere in the Arab world and act as a medium for or a forum where this kind of evidence or these kinds of expressions could be talked about? I mean, what, what sort of institution would that be? I don't know, but uh, Boris Groys talked about uh, the production of narrative and image and meaning as an archival practice. Um, um, uh, Franco Berardi was talking about games. Um, uh, the UAE and Qatar are obsessed with uh, building museums. Uh, uh, and this past edition of Documenta was the one with the highest number of Arabs in Kassel, in the history of Kassel. So where these things will go, I have no idea. Maybe they are forensic evidence for something. And maybe we should start thinking, or maybe thinking in terms of the forensic is um, an original and uh, new territory, uh, or thinking about uh, archives. Uh, I, 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 I'm not that smart. <laughs> I don't know. It also raises the question of um, research that is oriented already towards certain objects or certain contexts. Yes. You know. So, are we already presuming? the formats where our research ends, or is it, uh, so to speak, a non telic I mean, that, that's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty, is that you are forced as a curator, as an observer, as a writer, you are forced to, you know, I'm, you are forced to um, go into territories that are not familiar, you are forced to step outside of your comfort zone. I'll tell you another anecdote. There's a documentary film festival in Damascus called Dog's Box sort of famous because it's the only documentary film festival in Syria, but it's also the best documentary film festival in the Arab world. It was international in scope with a particular focus. On, and it's one of those beautiful insurgent cosmopolitan sites in the sense that uh, the first edition happened in 2008. It was a year when Damascus was cultural capital of the Arab world. It's a parallel program like cultural capital of where small cities become cultural capital of Europe. And um, so the organizers had to negotiate with censorship. And uh, they were given the very clear lines. At the, so because it was, uh, Damascus was cultural capital of the Arab world, the wife of, Hafiz, of uh, Bashar al-Assad was very involved and she, uh, the, the um, borders were loosened a bit and they were allowed to have their film festival with censorship but they were allowed to get money from Europe and from other places. The program was really interesting. There was, I, I can't remember the countries of origins of the documentaries, but one was about blind people, one was about deaf people, one was about elections in a high school in China and the corruption of the system, even within it. One was about a guy who emulated himself in a stadium. I think it was a Polish film in Poland. In other words, they were not allowed to show Syrian documentaries. But when they show a film, sorry, about the deaf or the blind or, you know, to a Syrian audience, the, the conversations were outstanding. I mean, and, and, and there was a tacit understanding of the allegorical dimensions of all of this. So this documentary film festival cannot take place in Damascus now, considering the situation. What the organizers have done is put together a series of short films, and the people that they collaborated with, the uh, institutions, the film, ITFA, Leipzig, etc., they, on, um, on, the, on March 15th, the anniversary of the, of the Syrian uh, insurgency, they screened these films, this package of Syrian films. This year they decided to uh, plow through, parse through the thousands of YouTube videos and put them together according to themes. And I showed uh, this program, and I had the privilege to show this program in, in Beirut. And it was really interesting to see how these 
uh, um, very political uh, documentary filmmakers were looking at this material that I cannot, I, I don't know how to define yet, and to make a collage out of it and to think that it's absolutely necessary to show. Um, I haven't digest, I haven't uh, thought a lot, uh, or I haven't been able to draw conclusions um, as to how I feel about this material yet, but um, things are happening and we will have to uh, figure out uh, whether they are dated, whether they are used in courts, whether uh, we, they go into a museum of revolutions, uh, whether they enter the school curricula. It's always a, a strange liminal kind of moment when you wonder about the afterlife of um, <coughs> such floating but nonetheless intensely compelling objects. Are we nearing the end of our time? Are we? Yeah? <laughs> okay. So maybe we close with a round of questions. Um, this is just, yeah. maybe I didn't hear something, but th was there a name or a title for that series of short films that ended up using the YouTube footage? Uh, yes, I mean, if you go on Facebook or on Google, it's called Doc's Box, oh. the film festival. You get, the, this, you get it all. Thank you. Maria? Just maybe one comment. Um because if we talk, and also to connect to Jonas's uh, uh, intervention here, when we talk about insurgent citizenry, we probably can, uh, we probably at the same time talking about, I mean, to bring it into our field, um, about what we used to call the audience, right? And the question is, what happens if there is this dramatic shift from viewer to consumer spectator to insurgent citizen. What does it mean? And I think to some extent Jonas was hitting into that question because we cannot go with our work as if it were business as usual. You know, the kind of go back from streets and demonstrations into the warm art institutions and organize one exhibition after another. It has enormous consequences into what is it that we actually are obliged almost to do when it comes to art production and when it comes to art institutions. And I, and I, I am not saying this because I expect to have a ready-made answer to this, but it's something that one needs to seriously take into consideration at this moment in history. I think if we in some way want to figure out how to move somewhere else out of this situation and uh, uh, try to constructively um, deal with the potential of the moment, whether violence is, a, is an answer to these things, um, um, we would need to get into a discussion what sort, of, what sort of violence indeed. And I don't think there is a choice between poetic political discourse and violence um, I think that's, that, that would be a fal false dichotomy to uh, engage in discussing. I think we need to go beyond that and get ourselves into some kind of another sort of plateau to get out of this strange roundabout where we find ourselves at this very moment. Um, I think so it's more a commentary, unless you do have a ready-made construction as to <laughs> what kind of implications this, this directly has to the art production and art institutions. Ready-made, definitely not. But to go further with your comments, I mean, if there is a production of knowledge and there is a production of poetics from that that will that is um, at the heart of insurgent cosmopolitanism or insurgent citizenship, I know that as a curator, what informs and what inspires me has changed radically. Where I go looking for meaning, 
uh, has changed radically. Where I go looking for validation, not yet. Um, the dog's box uh, thing that I was, it was, again, it's just an anecdote and I'm really sorry uh, to just keep s delivering anecdotes. It, we showed the films in a cabaret. We couldn't find an art space or a cinema that could host us in Beirut because people were afraid of backlash. So we went to a cabaret and it was really wonderful to have a glass of scotch and to watch films and to smoke a cigarette and to honor and to have a discussion um, we are to to rethink and or the it's not just a matter of reimagining an audience or go looking for new audiences it is um, Maybe it's starting with keywords like generosity, uh, like uh, hosting, right. like uh, translating, or like before said, empathy. Um, yeah, just disparate thoughts, no ready made. But thank you for the intervention, Marie and Russia. Thank you for this. And I think also that what we are being invited to do in many ways is, uh, do you have a question? Yes, please. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Marwa. I'm originally Libyan, but I live in Egypt. And I wanted to ask you all these um, um, document, like discussions and things that are happening in Lebanon and Syria. I feel like there's a lack of such thing in Egypt and especially in Libya. Um, how do you think these um, discussions and film uh, festivals and such can be transmitted to or start happening in such countries? I mean, I, I think that um, as far as I know, there are a lot of small things happening and um, maybe that's one answer to Maria. Big things don't need to happen. Maybe this is the time for small, uh, imperfect, uh, spontaneous, uh, anarchic, uh, non-institutional things to happen. Um, I, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not very up to date on the... Uh, I don't have a good uh, census of uh, what is happening on the ground right now in Egypt or in Libya, but uh, I know that the um, people who have come to me to ask me uh, where I, can I get this film or, or uh, can you come and talk about this. Um, I know there's three cine clubs in Benghazi right now uh, to which uh, I have uh, given films completely illegally but nobody needs to know but that's also part of uh, insurgency. Um, um, in Egypt there are a lot of new things uh, that are popping up and that have popped up. Um, I'm not into uh, social cultural policy. I ca can't really answer you. Uh, but I, I'm sure, I don't, I don't have that worry. I, th I think a lot of things are happening actually. I think it's, uh, yeah, but just to conclude and say that um, although community is a much overworked and exhausted trope, I think what we're being invited to look at is still to see if that trope can be revived and reanimated in unpredictable, unexpected, um, off-scale ways. And thank you very much for speaking out of your great expertise and, you. and your recent experiences and being so generous with your insights. Thank you. I want to tell you one thing before you leave. When you think about Iran 1978, guess who was there before the revolution happened? Like a month before. Andy Warhol. <laughs>